Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part two in the Apple II Plus video series, where we left off in part one, the machine wasn't working and I was gonna dig into repairs, but it turns out I had to do something first. The machine is super dirty and needs an extreme clean. So this video, there's a bunch of cleaning montages of me getting the machine spick and span and also taking a look at that little monitor that it came with. So let's get right to it. Well, when I left off in part one, the Apple II Plus didn't look like this. I've actually gone ahead and disassembled the machine. And originally in the first part, I mentioned I need to do a deep clean in this thing. Well, I didn't think I would need to do it quite so urgently, but uh, let us let me show you what I found when I looked inside of this a little closer. Pull the lid off here. So when I took a deeper look inside this machine, I saw something that was pretty disturbing. We saw a little bit of it when I pulled the power supply off and we saw some kind of crap and dead bugs. Well, just look at this machine here. It's really dirty. It's really, really dirty in here. I mean, you can just kind of see there's like bug legs and grass and who knows what in this thing. This thing feels like it probably lived a really long time in a barn. And here is the motherboard. And it's also pretty dirty, understandably. I mean, the rest of the inside of the computer is dirty, so there's no reason to think the motherboard would be spared. But like, just take a look up here. So there were three screws along the top of the motherboard here. And those screws were very rusty. And definitely some of the rust has made its way onto the motherboard. Now, I don't think anything is ruined on this motherboard. It's probably totally fine. It just... I'll need to do an absolute deep cleaning on this thing. It's going to need the old soap and water and toothbrush scrub trick because it's pretty bad. I'm going to need to work on this because of the fault that we saw in the first part. And I'd really like to get the motherboard as clean as possible. For the bottom here, I think if this speaker comes off, it seems to be pretty well glued on there. I'm going to take the vacuum and vacuum up as much as I can of this. And then I'll just use a Windex, I guess, and just give this a good scrubbing. I don't necessarily need to put this in the sink, although maybe I should as well, I, I don't know. And then that leaves us with the screws. As I mentioned in part one, some of the screws had been missing on this thing and one of the screw heads was broken off entirely. I don't know if that's because it may be rusted and seized up inside the machine and then snapped off when someone was trying to remove the head, but I'm gonna use a Dremel to try to slot the screw and pull that out. I also noticed on the underside of the keyboard, there are four screws that hold that onto the case. And one of those screws uh, was also broken. The rest of the screws that I did take out of this, I want to still reuse them, but they were all very rusty. So I've gone ahead, and this was yesterday, I threw them into some vinegar. And this has been in here less than 24 hours. As you can see by the liquid color there, some really good progress is being made. It, the vinegar removes the plating off the screw, so I will need to cover these up with something to prevent them from rusting again. There's the screws after a little rinsing. So that's a huge difference. I'm sorry I didn't record them when they were fully rusted, but they, they look a whole lot better now. I'll put some fresh vinegar in here and leave it for another 24 hours or so, and then I should be good to paint these. Fresh vinegar in the jar, and I think now it's time to attack this motherboard. I'm gonna give this a good scrubbing in the sink.
So here are the two broken off screws. There's this one that holds the bottom on. Some of the threads are exposed. And then down here on the keyboard, there's one right there as well. There are metal screw inserts inserted into this case. So I'm concerned they're brass, but the screws might have rusted into place and they're not gonna be completely fused in there, but it might be difficult to get out. So I think I'm gonna take the Dremel and I'm gonna try to slot both of these because they both are sticking out of the standoffs. And then I will use a, a small flat blade to try to get them out. So this is the keyboard and it's an Alps SKCC keyboard actually. If I flip it over, it's really dirty. Uh, the PCB here says made by Apple computer, or at least it has their name on it, but I can definitely tell these are Alps SKCC switches. And this little PCB that's on here, this is normal for the Apple II. This is the keyboard encoder. So it takes the keyboard matrix, which is all these traces that run from all the switches and it they run up to these this row of pins here and then it goes into this board which has a microcontroller i think and some you know support logic chips and then this connects to the motherboard and this sends your key presses to the computer on the apple IIe, the keyboard matrix as far as i'm aware just connects directly to the motherboard this keyboard encoder portion is built into the chipset on the motherboard but on the original apple II and apple II plus it was external and because the encoder converts the matrix into the, what the computer needs, if you have a different keyboard that has a different keyboard matrix, you just need the appropriate encoder board to send the Apple II the right signals. So whatever, you know, if you're pushing the, the space bar, it thinks you're pressing the space bar. That's the encoder doing that. So, so I presume there are different keyboards and different encoder board combinations. So this keyboard is extremely dirty. If you can take a look in there, it's really, really bad. So I'm gonna disassemble this as much as I can. So because this has switches that are soldered onto the PCB here, I don't want to submerge this in water. I'm not gonna wash this under the faucet. I am gonna take all the keys off though, and I'm gonna clean the base plate as much as I had to get this bug guts and filth off of here. And then I'll uh, take the encoder off and clean that up a bit as well. Here is the two plus keyboard with all the keys removed. And oh boy, that does not look good. So it is weird. This is an Alps SKCC switch keyboard. So the, these are some of the Alps switches right here, but most of the keys or actually all the keys have these kind of adapters on them, which seem to slant the keys at an angle. Some of the adapters came off with the key, which is why you see the actual regular stem other, most of them stayed behind. This bin here has soapy warm water in it. I know the studs are kind of gone now, but um, I'll let these soak a little bit and then I'll attack them and actually clean each one individually. Oh, they're just, they're dirty, but they're cleaning up. So it's definitely not perfect, but it's a lot better. Definitely some liquid had spilled on here at some point, so it's kind of rusty here. Uh, ideally, I should at least try to scrape away the loose paint here and then just paint some rust converter to stop any further rusting. It's not really bad, the corrosion, it's just the paint has bubbled up. But that's the base plate on the keyboard in a computer that was stored in a damp place with all the dirt and liquids probably dripped on here. Who knows, we'll, we'll see if these switches even work. I might have to switch them out.
Well, it's the next day. The keys are all dried out. I leave them facing up like this, so any water that's stuck on the underside here will have evaporated. And I have let the 303 protectant soak in on all these keys, and it's actually ready for reassembly. On the iPad right up here, I have a photograph of the keyboard, so I'm ready to go with the layout. So let me time-lapse install this whole thing. I'm interrupting because this is the space bar and it just looks pretty horrible. And in fact, on the side, it's sort of splotchy. And it's something that actually, strangely, a lot of these keys have. I think the top of the keys are gonna look fine, but the sides have this strange splotchiness. And even with Magic Eraser cleaning this off, uh, then 303 protectant to kind of reinvigorate the plastic, give it that luster, didn't seem to really work. And I don't really know what's causing that splotchiness. Here's the Y key, and I'm hoping that you can see what I'm talking about there on the side. See, it sort of has splotches there. Uh, this side a little bit. There, it's got more of it there. It's like a discoloration almost. I guess the plastic is just breaking down. I don't know. Sweet, that is one cleaned up keyboard. There's one thing to consider, all of the ALP switches have built-in springs inside the switch. The recess switch though has a helper spring that is under the key. That makes it harder to push. So if you're pushing like enter and you accidentally bump the reset, there's a less likely chance you're gonna hit this. I kind of remember on my Apple II Plus that I used to hit that key accidentally and I don't think you have to hold down control to push this like you do on later apples. That was something they added in, so even when you hit reset accidentally, you don't like exit out of your program. Uh, I'll have to see when this computer's hooked up if you have to pit, push control, but I don't think so, not on this one. Listen to this Alps ping. Hear that distinctive ping after the key pushes? That's, that's a real clue that this is an Alps SKCC based board. Let's take a quick look at this Panasonic monitor now that it's actually cleaned up. So it's pretty cool. Uh, this is a 10 inch CRT <laughs> color, right? We determined that because it's got this color monochrome switch here. On the front, there are little slider controls. So contrast, brightness, we have a volume. So this obviously has a built-in speaker of some type and we have a power switch over here on the right. And over here on the left, there is a color and character mode, which would imply that it's monochrome. On the side, we have probably one of the speaker grills or maybe a vent and the speakers on the other side. Let's take a look at the back. So there it is, dual mode computer display, model DTS-101, 120 volts. Looks like behind here, there's a small cover you can pop off to adjust the uh, R and the B cutoff and the R and the B drive. So that's kind of neat, you can do that externally. Although look, caution, do not remove unless you're a service technician. Here are the inputs. We have an in and an out, so a pass through. 75 ohm termination or high, and we have audio in. So the reason for the high switch is that if you have something plugged into the input and the output, you wanna turn off the 75 ohm termination because say you plug two monitors into each other, well, if both monitors have 75 ohm termination, it will basically create a dim picture on both of them. So on this one, if you switch it over to high and you loop through this, then basically this monitor will rely on the termination that's on the last monitor in the chain. And the image on both monitors will not be overly dim because generally the video input goes straight into a buffer of some type. And the only thing that would cause the dimming is that 75 ohm resistor to ground, which is the termination. And that is when you flip that there. So, in the, so if this is the only monitor in the chain, you wanna have 75 ohm engaged, but if you are connecting two, you would switch it to high. And here's a date code, June 1984 for the manufacturing. So yeah, it's a good age, this little monitor. And then here's that model number again, DTS-101-001. And there's a chassis number, NMX K102A. I almost forgot to point out, it's made in Japan. All the best stuff is made in Japan. And on the back here, we have a nice slew of controls as well. There's the color and the tint, V centering, H centering. There's no size controls, I notice. Over here, there's a screw terminal for H-hold. 
Then there's a service toggle for service mode or normal that would typically disable the vertical deflection and give you a horizontal line across the center of the picture, allow you for adjusting the drive and the cutoffs. And then there's a screen control and a focus control externally accessible. Those will probably be on the flyback transformer. Oh, and there's actually a V size and a V hold control there and a sharpness control. Okay, so I'm gonna connect up my signal generator to the input. There it is, termination is enabled. Turn this around and plug in the mains power. Let's power this up, see if anything explodes. All right, we've got high voltage, a little static on the screen, everything sounds completely normal, no abnormal sounds coming out of this thing. Oh, look, and there is a picture. Oh, let's see here. Okay, let's adjust in the contrast and the brightness. Sweet. Okay, well, the plots are a little scratchy. Obviously, let me move them back and forth a few times. I'll definitely need some deoxid in these uh, slider pots. All right, so this is the contrast control. Interesting, it actually is adjusting the contrast. A lot of TVs have what's labeled as contrast, but all that's actually doing is adjusting the white level and the brightness control adjusts the black level. So if we set this contrast in the middle and I move the brightness, you may be able to see in the camera that this section down here now becomes visible. So like it's brought the entire black level up, it brightens everything at the same point, but that's what the brightness control is doing. But on this TV, if I turn the contrast all the way down, notice this is now kind of gray and everything else is as well. And if I turn it the other way, this gets darker and everything else gets brighter. So it actually is working like a true contrast knob, which is fascinating, but uh, these work together to accomplish the same thing. Well, I'm quite amazed that the picture looks pretty good. I'm just adjusting things on the back here. So let's see here, what does this one do? That must be sharpness. This one is tint. And there's the color. Oh, very scratchy color control. Ooh. I'd say based on the way these color bars look, there's probably a little bit of adjustment I should do on the red and the green drive. It seems like the blue is maybe a little too low or actually the cutoff, but uh, yeah. And then this is the horizontal side placement and the vertical placement. Nice. Checking out convergence. It's looking great. No particular issues. A little out of convergence on the side, but psh, color CRTs of this age, it's extremely common. That's the case. So what this test pattern does is it's showing vertical lines and they're wider and further apart and they get closer and closer and closer together until over on this side, it's very high bandwidth, I think up to six megahertz. So that means they're very close together. So you might see on the camera some colors here. And this is happening because they are basically overlapping with the color carrier on NTSC and you get these bands. But if I push the little button on the bottom here, it should disable color and it does. And I'm tweaking the sharpness control on the back. So that's all the way down. And as we turn this up, now sharpness can be called peaking, where it artificially adds some extra peaking, where basically it, it ramps up the difference between light and dark, makes vertical lines ap appear sharper. And that's why when I turn it up, this gets brighter here because it's artificially you know, creating sharpness where there isn't actually a need to do that. Now, one thing I'm noticing is the CRT has a very high dot pitch. And that means that the size of the RGB dots on here are quite large. Now for watching regular color pictures, totally fine. But what that means is this screen will not look good in 80 columns at all. You just, it won't be very sharp. Even when you push the monochrome switch here to, to engage the high resolution mode, it still won't look that good. And that's just, that's just the fact that this CRT is just not a very high resolution. Now the one really cool benefit of this switch, if we turn it on to color mode and we switch back to color bars, so there's color bars, if you push this, if you're using an Apple II and say it's a graphical screen that's designed with mostly text on it, you will get a lot of color fringing, that purple and green lines all over the letters. Well, on this monitor, you just push that button and it gets rid of all of that. Of course, you'll have a black and white picture and probably a little extra sharpness as well. I'm not positive if it's actually removing some of the filtering that you need for a color NTSC signal. Now, people may be familiar with the Apple Color 2E monitor, that monitor has a similar switch to this, but that uses a very high resolution CRT. So 80 columns looks great on that screen. When you push that button, it makes it really high resolution. In fact, that monitor, when the color signal is killed, when the computer outputs a pure monochrome signal, it automatically turns on the high resolution mode and removes all of the filtering on the Luma signal that a color screen normally has, which produces incredibly sharp image. When you use color mode, if you don't filter it, you get these dot patterns and stuff like that. 
but I have a feeling that this screen, along with pretty much any other NTSC color screen I've ever seen, when you send a pure monochrome signal into it, it still doesn't disable the filtering circuitry and you always get a soft picture, even when there's no color. The only way around that, like say on a Commodore 1702 monitor or on any of the other Commodore or 1084, stuff like that, to get a high resolution monochrome NTSC signal, you have to put it into the YC Luma Chroma input and only connect it to the Y, which is the Luma signal. So it will be black and white and high resolution because that input does not have that filtering on it. But the regular composite input has permanent filtering on it. There's no way to disable it. But hey, this monitor works and it works really well. Considering the age, I just love the compact size. Let me just put a floppy disk here compared to the screen size just for comparison. And you'll notice that it's a pretty little monitor. And even when we look at the size, it's also not that big. Thumbs up. You may have noticed that there's some paint on my hands here. And that's because outside I am painting those screws with some rust converter. And unfortunately the nozzle on my can has kind of given up the ghost. So while I was trying to get it working, I ended up getting paint on my hand. So you could just ignore that. That's not a problem. I, I haven't cut myself for once. So with the case all taken care of, it is now time to try to troubleshoot and repair this Apple II Plus motherboard. It's been about 24 hours since I washed it, and wow, does it look absolutely stunning. This thing looks absolutely brand new. I cannot believe how, how good it looks now. A little bit of elbow grease with soap and water and a good washing, and it looks amazing. Just take a look at this thing. Look at it. I'm blown away. I, I honestly couldn't tell that this thing wasn't sitting in a box its entire life, never having been used. I mean, look, it's just, it's fantastic. There's no visible corrosion anywhere. All the chips look nice and clean. There's no dirt. It's all shiny. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of gushing, but I'm, I'm really proud of just how nice this thing looks. Now, before we get started, one thing I was trying to do is trying to determine when this motherboard was made. Now, as far as I can tell, and I thought I saw a mark on here somewhere, that this is the RFI version of the motherboard. It says right here, Apple 1979, Apple II main logic board RFI. Oh yeah, that's where it says RFI. There is a part number 820044-D. I'm not sure what years the, this particular RFI board was being made, but I know that this was made up until the end of the Apple II Plus line. Now, judging by the fact it says 1979 there, probably makes me believe that this was the one that you know, was made for the majority of years of the Apple II. Now, since most ICs are in sockets, it's hard to know what people have been switching around on this thing, because clearly this computer had been opened, you know, considering there were broken screws and missing screws. So I don't know what's original on here and what's been changed. Now there are soldered ICs. There's one here, one down here, and one here. Now, unfortunately, these two ICs don't have day codes, but this one up here by the IO over here, it does. In addition though, I actually went through every IC on here and anyone that had a day code, I wrote it down on a piece of paper. Here's what I found. The soldered IC has 1982 day code 19th week. So maybe that's when this board was made or like slightly after that. But then look at the spread of dates of these ICs. Here's 1978, so anything that was from then, I put in a column there, and there's 1983. I think the majority of stuff has 1981 date codes. When I put dots after it, that meant I found multiple chips with the same date code, exact same date code, right? But I don't know, 81, 82 are the majority, but there's a good amount of chips from 80, there's three or four from 79, one from 78, and then one from 83. So what exactly is going on here? And when was this motherboard made? The power supply, if you recall, when I took that apart, had a date code of sometime in 1983. But the Apple II Plus wasn't made any longer in 83, at least as far as I can tell. And this power supply was also used in the Apple IIe. So it's quite possible that this one came out of a IIe and was put into this case. And maybe this whole computer was used as like a test bed and people swap chips constantly in here, and that's why it's got this crazy assortment of chips from all these different eras. In fact, up here by the CPU, this is the 8T97s. These are sort of like bus drivers in a way. This one is from 80, this one's from 8246, and this one's from 1978. What the heck? 
Why would there be three different chips in here? I just do not believe that Apple would be sticking 1978 chips into a motherboard that was being manufactured. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Now, I think I had mentioned that I have never worked on an Apple II Plus in my life. I had one as a kid, but other than opening it up and checking out the cards were inside, it never had a fault. So I never need to troubleshoot it. Not that I even knew what I was doing back then. I, I was a kid, right? And I, I didn't really learn about electronics until later. So I am not familiar with the normalcy. So if you're used to working on Apple II Pluses and you've seen a lot of them, and you think that maybe this insanity here with this assortment of dates is normal, please let me know in the comment section below. I will be fascinated to hear some stories. There is one thing. All of the RAM chips, except for the one that goes to the language card, are Apple branded and they are the same exact part. They are NEC chips. None have date codes, so I'm not sure when these are from, but none of these, I guess, have been swapped out in the crazy life of whatever this machine had. Anyhow, let's plug the RetroTINK into the output of the Apple. Uh, power supply is in, power is on, it's connected. Let's turn this on to see if we still have that same exact fault, which I completely expect it'll be exactly the same. We got nothing. Interesting. Okay, so remember with troubleshooting, the first thing to do, check the power. Now I did check the power originally, and we saw that it had output, had video, so uh, this seems worse than it actually was. So let me turn this quickly on, I have the multimeter there. I will just check power on one of these bypass caps. 5.0 volts, looking good. Remember I had said that I thought the 5.2 I saw on the power supply would probably drop down <laughs> once it was under load? Well, sure enough, that happened. All right, in my effort to check power, this is one of the RAM chips, the pinout. I am gonna check for the minus five and the plus 12 and plus five on the RAM chips. Make sure that those look good as well. On the Apple II, the chips are mounted with pin one facing me, so it helps when you're looking at something like your phone. Flip it around so it's in the correct orientation. So this should be minus five, minus 5.3. It's a little high to be honest, but it's probably gonna be okay. And there we have 12 volts, which is 11.8. So the voltages seem okay, if not slightly high. I think now I need to bust out the oscilloscope. Well, I'm sorry to say that's gonna be it for this video. The machine is nice and clean now, and I feel okay touching it. I really don't like working on things that have dead bug pieces everywhere. So the machine is working seemingly worse than in part one, so it's gonna be in part three that I'm really gonna dig into fixing this machine and getting it running perfectly. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do, hit that thumbs down button, hit that subscribe button to subscribe to my channel, and of course the bell icon if you maybe wanna be notified when Google feels that it can do that, which is pretty much never. And of course, put your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below, and that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.